thanks so much for giving me your time here. Can you? I'm really curious how you started in martial arts, and is it true that you and Bob Jones developed Zendo Kai? Yes. I started judo when I was about 11 years of age. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason it's judo because I think that was pretty much the only martial art around at the time. And uh, it happened through, I used to live in a suburb of Melbourne called Croydon. And a kid moved into the house opposite where I lived and blah, blah, blah. He ended up disappearing a couple of nights a week. And I remember asking him where he was going. He said, oh, I'm doing judo classes. And I was like, oh man, I want to go. And it was being run in a, another suburb of Melbourne called Nana Wadding and a police sergeant, Black Belt and Judo, was running the classes. And I, I literally remember reading about Judo on the back of comic books. You know, okay, yeah. Defeat five attackers with a twist of a finger, you know, all that stuff. And, and man, I, I was like the skinniest 11-year-old you could come across. I just had a fascination then even you know, for the, for the mystical side of martial arts, a little bit I read, in this case pertaining to judo. And so I went along and started doing judo, and I, that experience for me was kind of being like, I used to say, it's like one of those comic book characters, you know, where I was getting pitched from one end of the dojo to the other by the older brown belts and stuff, because I was just little. And, uh, but, it was, but it was a great intro, John Burge, his name was, it was my instructor then, it was very nurturing. I remember it just being an amazing experience, because as you know, it could have been anything but mm, yeah. <laughs> as a you know, little 11 year old kid. So um, anyway, one of the guys that was training there was um, a guy called John Rowe, who I went to school with. And a couple of years, a few years into it, John uh, happened to say, Wow, there's a there's a karate school opening up in Bayswater, which is about in those days it was miles, three miles from where I lived in Croydon. And um, this particular guy, John, was already learning karate in his garage from Masayama's book. Yeah, right. You know, this is karate, and he would he was at school bending pins with his knuckles and breaking boards and stuff. And we're like, oh my god, you know what is this? Kicking bags and you know it was all self-taught for him. So we went along to this uh, opening lesson in Bayswater, it was Tino Sobrano. For those who don't know, Tino uh, Sobrano was Kate Sobrano's father. The you know, musician. Well-known singer. Yep. And uh, Tino is Hawaiian-Filipino, he's of uh, Filipino heritage, but grew up in Hawaii. And Tino pretty much introduced Goju, and then Goju Ru, Goju Kai, as it was called, into Australia, Hard Sauce System. And he did a little demonstration and it just blew me away because it was pretty much what we call H pattern forms, you know, Takeoka Joda and Chunagan, it was just like using basic blocks. They did some Jukumite, and this was just a handful of students because Tino had only been in the country, I should say Hanshi Tino, a matter of months, and he had a handful, and they did this demonstration, did Jukumite, which is pretty much like soft non contact sparring. And I just remember going, oh man, this is what I need to do. Mm. Because I saw it as a standoff sort of art that wouldn't rely on strength and size the same way judo did. Um, and it was, it relied on speed and everything else. And so I joined up immediately and that's what started me on my journey. And one of the students of Tino's at the same time was Bob Jones. Bob, 10 years older than I, you won't want me to say that. So that means he's 45 now, <laughs> and um, Bob, Bob already was such a phenomenal fighter, he ran security in Melbourne, he'd already been doing a little bit of karate, um, and uh, anyway, we, we just got on really well, whatever amount of years later Bob wanted to start his own style, and wanted me to go with him, I was a little conflicted at the time just because you know, of Tino, but I went and that was the beginnings of Zendokai, which we started in 1970. Wow. So it was really Bob's thing, you know, the style, but he wanted me to go with him, so I became his partner in it. You know, head instructor of Zendokai in 70. Interesting times because most of the students then were bouncers and doormen mm -hmm. on the day, so it was pretty rough and tumble. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Zendokai for us literally uh, not literally because it wasn't a direct translation of Zendokai to anyone who knows Japanese, but 
we kind of called it the best of everything in progression. So it was an eclectic system? Absolutely. It was the first real eclectic system in Australia because back in those days, if you did goju, you only did goju. If you did judo, you only did judo. You didn't mix styles. So it was really, a, in our own way, a precursor to MMA, not in a, in a sports sense. People think of MMA as being UFC. When UFC is really a sport version of mixing martial arts. Well, even back then we were mixing bits of judo, boxing, etc., etc., into what we did, with the main real reason being to make it as effective as what we were doing could be for the guys that were doing reality-based work, as in being bouncers, bodyguards, or whatever. Um, and uh, on it went. So that was that was the start of an incredible journey for me. I remember hearing a rumor where, Uh-oh. yeah, this is pretty cool, but. Uh, the rumour I'd heard was that, I think back in the Zendo Kai days, you guys used to do a lot of security at rock concerts. Mm. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is where you developed a system called blitzing. And it was like, you, there was, at this concert, there was, the story I'd heard was there were you yourself and maybe a small group of guys, half a dozen guys, and you waded through a, a bunch of, you know, maybe a hundred guys just knocking them out on the go. Like, is there any truth to that? Because I remember hearing this and you guys, it was almost like the, the Spartan sort of thing where a small group of guys overcame a much larger army of sort of drunken, unruly men at a rock concert. Uh, you know, it's always funny when I hear stories back because I'm like, oh, well, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> you know, as they say, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, I know. There's lots of things happen. We we did have issues, you know, like the Rolling Stones in Adelaide. There were literally a couple thousand people outside these fences that couldn't get into the concert, and they started beating on police and all sorts of stuff. Knocked the fences down. We're coming through. And it was just Bob, and myself, another guy, um, Stewie Lomax, was with us. And, uh, it was kind of like, wow, this is pretty interesting. So yes, those sorts of situations led to a very few against a lot, you yeah. know? Um, and and, the, and the, the scenario for that used to happen a lot with pop concerts only because there's a handful of you and there's always, you know, a mega audience of potential troublemakers. <laughs> um, as for particular stories, not sure, maybe. Mm. I don't like to really go back and relive those days. They're amazing times. Yeah. Um, and, and again, our system of Zendikar was based on will it work in the street? Yeah, fair enough. That, that's not to, by the way, say that there wasn't an absolute respect and love for the traditional arts because our base was goju, um, the karate in the way of kata and everything we did. It's just that our classes involved maybe getting, you know, a student would have to get another student a headlock and get from one end of the dojo to the other end and it could be 50 people in class whose job was to stop you getting that person to the door. Okay, yeah. So you would, even back then we were pressure testing what we did because it's almost impossible for you to have one person a headlock and get there from there. But to have that, that, that kind of pressure put on you really held you in good stead for situations like you would run into as a bodyguard or as a doorman. Because as you know with the door, there's usually one, maybe two, people on the door, maybe a couple more, and generally you're up against and outnumbered, you know, depending on who came to the door, they're usually a bunch of drunks and everything else. So a lot of the training was to handle situations like that, the adrenaline dump, as we call it, you know, that, that would affect you in a real life situation. And we just wanted to know what that felt like and prepare students, because unfortunately in a, in a traditional dojo, there isn't that pressure testing. I call it all, all that sort of training, you know, that you get in a traditional dojo, I call uh, consensual sparring. Mm-hmm. If I get out in the dojo and I know I'm going to spar you, you're going to spar me, there's rules to it, there's an instructor that's going to yell you may or stop, things get out of hand. You know, there was an etiquette that was observed. Boxing's contentious. You get in the ring, I know I'm going to fight, you know, this guy over here, ding, the bell rings, ding, the bell stops, you stop. So there's no, you know, there were rules and everything. And the UFC is the same, it's consensual sparring. Nobody's gonna jump in and jump on top of you most of the time. It's a one-on-one situation. The problem with all of that in the street is there are no rules. You don't know how many people are involved in an altercation you might get into one with one individual. You know, it could be 
who are his mates, who else is around, who's going to jump in. So the whole mindset is incredibly different as well. You know, I was very much a traditionalist at heart. I love the traditions of the, of the martial art. We talk about that there's martial art, there's the martial side and then there's the art side, which really need to be paired in my mind, you know, to be what I would call a genuine martial artist. You've been a, uh, a bodyguard to many great bands and musicians such as ABBA, Fleetwood Mac, Rolling Stones, amongst others. What was John Belushi like? Uh, John, was, John was fantastic. Um, you know how that started? Uh, you know, I was working with, which a lot of the young ones don't know a lot of these names. Uh, Linda Ronstadt in her day was, was a massive star in rock and roll, used to sing country and western. She also did operetta, she, you know, she did Pirates of Penzance on the stage in New York. Anyway, we toured with her, Bob and I toured with Linda in probably 1978 or whatever it was. Uh, I got very close with Linda. She was the one that basically took me to the US. Mm -hmm. She wanted me to go and work full time for her. And I was a bit like, mm, I've got schools here, you know, running Zender Kai with, with Bob, very happy, all that stuff. I eventually decided to go uh, and try it out. I said to everybody, I'll, I'll be back in a few months. Of course, you know, 35 years later, I'm still there. But So I went over and, and one of the uh, gigs that I did with Linda was Saturday Night Live. I was in her dressing room. I used to give Linda exercise and warm up and everything. And John came in and a bit of a conversation. And so through that process, I suddenly became who John wanted to work with him when he was going out on the road with the Blues Brothers, cool. with Danny Aykroyd. And uh, and at that stage, I, said, oh, look, I'm, I was committed. I was working with Fleetwood Mac at the time, James Taylor, David Bowie. So I was, had a pretty full slate as far as doing personal bodyguard work. But anyway, John, John was very persistent. And by the way, it's not really based on anything he saw then. The industry then, working with bands, is really based on somebody else saying, you are the one they should use. The fact that I was already with Linda and, and James Taylor and Fleetwood Mac went, oh, well, I'm the one he should have. Mm -hmm. I, I went and started working with him, giving him exercises, teaching him martial arts. And uh, he, you know, I ended up working with him. They really pressed me, and I ended up working with him during the shooting of the Blues Brothers movie. Yeah, cool. Which was pretty exciting because I got to actually be on stage and meet Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles and icons like this. Yeah. And you know, of course, he did the movie with Danny Aykroyd. And John, John, for me, was just such a big-hearted guy. He was extravagant in every way you could think, meaning. With his eating, with anything he did, he was just full on, and it's no secret, drug taking was a bit of a part of that. Because mm -hmm. I remember saying to John one day, I said, what is it with you? you know, I mean, you're just on a suicide mission, you know, with, with the extravagance, whether it's the food or whatever. And, uh, but that was just his, his character, you know. I, I remember waking him up at a house, he was renting in LA when we were doing Blues Brothers movie, and I'd have his wife, Judy, at the time, uh, getting, uh, you know, your wife's on the phone, come on, wake up, we're going to work out. And he'd be on the phone, yeah, hi. <laughs> he'd be fast asleep, you know. And, uh, but I, I, I got very close with John. As I said, he was a lovely guy. In fact, funny little side note, if anyone remembers Octagon. Octagon was the first movie that I did with Chuck Norris. And I remember showing John, this, you know, a couple of the scenes that I was doing as Keo, who was Which the main bad guy. Samurai. Samurai, yeah. you know, the main mass ninja warrior. And also I played this character, Long Legs, which is pretty funny because I got short legs, but anyway. <laughs> Long Legs, who was another character I was playing in the film. And I had this fight scene with Chuck. I was supposed to grab him from behind and say, you go when, I, when he tells you you can go, because my boss, and they were having a, Chuck was being, kind of auditioned, he wanted to become part of this terrorist group because he was trying to infiltrate. Anyway, so he's starting to leave and I showed John this and John said, ah, 
I'm like, this is what you should do. You know, when you grab him on the shoulder, because Chuck kind of kicks his heel back, kicks me in the groin. And John was the one that choreographed that for me. He said, yeah, as soon as he kicks you, just sort of go, oh, shit, shit. And then I end up re-grabbing him and, you know, on the shoulder and, oh, and Chuck just sort of flattens me. But that, that's a pretty interesting little side note that John actually came up with the choreography for that yeah, cool. particular scene. He was also the one that said to me, no, you be careful, you don't do anything that's dangerous when you're making a movie, you've got to stay healthy. Of course, he's on the Universal lock, fell off a um, skateboard and sprained his ankle, he's in plaster. <laughs> But lovely guy, and, and that's actually, you know, the, the ongoing story with that was they were doing the Blue Brothers tour, and they, he wanted me to go, I said I can't, and to the point that John actually said he wouldn't do the tour unless I did it with him, which was kind of nice, and I said, oh, that, that's a bit silly, I'll find somebody, and it was through a couple of the band members being from Memphis, and I knew Bill Wallace was from Memphis, and I was also very good friends with Bill, that I suggested hooking Bill and John up. And that's how Bill Wallace ended up working with John Belushi. And they you know, established a really, really great relationship. Um, another funny tidbit of that was being at a, Jun Chong, I think it was, had a school in uh, Wilshire Boulevard in LA. And I went and said hi to John and Bill when they were working out. And anyone who knows, Bill Wallace's nickname was Superfoot because he could kick ridiculously fast and he became a world kickboxing champion on the day and was just an amazing kicker. So he's going up and down the dojo with Bill and Bill's back, back. And I look at John and John's like kicking him at this far <laughs> up the floor. It was just such a funny look to me and John sort of comes toward me, looks at me and said, yeah, I'm going to use this in my next street fight. And it was <laughs> just, but anyway, he, he had a heart of gold and, and in fact, Bill has Anyone who follows that was actually the one that found John Belushi dead in uh, in his hotel room really? at the Chateau Marmont. Yeah, okay. He was, came and found him, no response. Bill actually gave him a heart massage, mouth to mouth, tried to revive him, but of course he couldn't. So that was a pretty impactful time in the history of mm. rock and roll and artists, you know, among mm. the likes of John Belushi, but fantastic guy. Uh, I ended up, by the way, going to John Belushi's funeral with with James Taylor. We, we were on, I was on tour with James in the States, took a, a jet over to Martha's Vineyard, which is a uh, you know, little place off the coast of Massachusetts. Over in the east coast of America, it was an open coffin funeral. And uh, it was, it, that was such an incredible experience to go with James. There were a lot of the present players, you know, um, from Saturday Night Live that worked with John. And you got John, 32 or three years of age, lying his coffin. It was an Albanian Orthodox priest, and uh, we're in this church, and look, I'm not giving away s secrets here, because everybody knows what that rock and roll industry is like, but a lot of the people in Den outside, still doing a couple of lines of coke going in, and for those who don't know, John basically died from a thing called freebasing, where you mixed cocaine with heroin, and uh, it's what basically killed him, and I remember going in there, and priest was giving this big speech about someone like John never really seeing his attributes really come to full fruition. And again, you got to understand, this is a small church and there's John Belushi lying there in a coffin. And it's like he looked, and suddenly um, the priest, it's like he took time and he just started looking at everybody in the church. And, and this big voice, he boomed out, wise up. And I was like, you could hear a pin drop. And I just thought that was a, a very telling moment. I remember saying to James after, I mean, do you think anybody really learns from that that are there? In other words, oh, isn't it awful? You know, my wife used to say, you know, you get somebody that dies, you become coffee book chatter for two days, and then you just get on with your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way it works, you know? Mm -hmm. you, you would hope from something like that that even those people that tend to learn something about their behaviour and everything, you know, including including John's in this case. You, you mentioned Chuck Norris before. How did that relationship come about? Yeah, friends? with Chuck, that started here in Australia because Bob Jones went over to America. See, I was very much tied with the Japanese way. Bob really loved 
the American way because of the eclectic sort of attitude of being open, a little more of a modern approach to martial arts, if you will. But so he went over and uh, ended up meeting Chuck Norris and bringing him out to Australia. I guess this is 78. And uh, we had, you know, Bob had pretty much introduced kickboxing as we know it into Australia, WKA. He was one of the people that coined the actual um, name for that. And so we brought Chuck out. Chuck did some demonstrations on some tournaments we were hosting in Melbourne and Adelaide and Sydney. And I was demonstrating using Sai and Bo and doing my own demonstration. We just ended up getting on like a house on fire and uh, hung out together. And you know, Chuck, if anyone ever gets a chance, you couldn't meet a nicer guy than Chuck Norris. Yeah, cool. And he was the one that said to me, look, if you ever get to California, look me up and we'll do some training. You can imagine for a guy, you know, in Melbourne, Australia, back then it was so much less accessible, that whole wide world out there. It's not like the amount of airlines and flights and everything else that give you access to the world. So for me, that was like, wow, what an amazing invitation. So when I went over to work for Linda and James Taylor, Chuck was the first person I called. Immediately I started training every morning at Chuck's house. He had a gym at the back of his house place called Rolling Hills Estates near how far from Los Angeles Airport. And so I started training with Chuck every morning and you know it, what an incredible opportunity for me and experience and we're still friends to this day. Chuck was the best man at my wedding, you know, to my beautiful wife Judy and um, it's a friendship that's just stuck. And Chuck was the one that did so much for me as far as introducing me to people like Bill Wallace. I ended up training with Bill for a month in Memphis, helping him train for some of his last actual, you know, title fights. And uh, Benny the Jet Urquidez, because everybody respected Chuck so much, it immediately opened doors that I was a friend of Chuck's, you know. The rest of it, of course, is history. I just took advantage of all of that, trained with people like Fumio Demura, who again was a very legendary traditional martial artist out in a place called Orange County. I trained with Chuck in the morning, going train with Fumio, going train with Benedict Urquidez, who's, for those again who don't know, who is undefeated kickboxing champion of the day, just an absolute legend, still is. And he had a gym at his brother Arnold's house in a place called Mission Hills, and was just a big tin shed. It was sometimes in the, of Fahrenheit days, get up to like 110 degrees, and Arnold was a taskmaster, and that's where I started training with Benny. This was before the Jet Center was formed, and met amazing people through that. And uh, so Chuck, you know, really got me started on my film career, and as I said, just a career of being able to train and be blessed to train with some of the best people in the world. And did that open up doors, or how did, uh, I guess, the journey over to Hong Kong with the Chinese opera and people like Sammo Hung, Jackie Chan, Yun Biao, how did that come about? Yeah, well, the initial uh, impetus for that was, first of all, as I'd already mentioned, you know, Chuck New York could handle Okinawan weapons, Saibo and all of this. Octagon, there was the main baddie, there was Tadashi Yamashita. Yep. who was the head guy, and I was like his right-hand man. It was going to be a huge fight with Chuck at the end of the movie. And Chuck, because of the demos I did in Australia, knew I could handle weapons, and he asked me if I would play that role. So I helped choreograph a lot of those fights with Chuck's brother, Aaron, at the back of Chuck's house, because uh, we shot that again in 1979. So that was my start in the film world, where I went, wow, this is, this is kind of fun, you know? I get the meet all these amazing people. That's where I did meet uh, Sensei Yamashita and started training with him for a couple of years and blah, blah, blah. So it, it was the impetus to then, I got cast or got asked to audition for a film called Force Five that was shot in 1981. That was with Benny the Jet and Joe Lewis, the legendary Joe Lewis, who no longer with us. He was um, the boxer? No, 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 not karate the karate guy. guy. Karate yeah, guy was, yeah used to fight at the same time Chuck did, he was a heavyweight and just a terror on the circuit. Again, a real legend of his day and um, Master Bong Su Han, Master in Hub Kido. Uh, so we, you know, got to meet all these people and Keith Vitale and Joe Cawley, you know, there was all these unbelievable people on the set. So I, uh, the fight choreographer on that movie was a gentleman named Pat Johnson, who used to be partners with Chuck. 
an amazing martial artist who I spent a lot of time and learned so much from. He then uh, mentioned me to Jackie. He wanted, you know, he thought I'd be great for, for work with Jackie because Pat had worked with Jackie on The Big Brawl, which is one of his very early movies that he shot in America. So anyway, he mentioned all this chain, and I happened to be in a place out called the outside Fukuoka, which is a you know, city in Japan, you know, not that far from Osaka, and I got this call. I said, oh, Richard, this is Jackie Chan's assistant, whatever. Um, Jackie wants you to work in this movie. What's your price? I said, yeah. well, wait a minute, what do you mean, you know? Yes, he wants you to be. I said, when would I have to be there? He said, oh, you have to be here in three days time. I said, you know, and, and again, what's your price? <laughs> I yeah. said, well, it doesn't matter what my price is because I'm committed on, I'm working, you know, with a band, I was with Linda at the time, and I said, I can't get there. So anyway, that opportunity passed, and then the opportunity came up again, and they gave me a call and wanted me to work in Twinkle Twinkle Lucky Stars. Oh, if I go to Hong Kong, I, goodness knows, when would that have been? Early 80s. Um, and that was a movie directed by Sammo Hong and with Jackie. And I remember going thinking, wow, this would be good, you know, I'll be able to do a lot of my own stuff. Well, it was such an eye-opener to be working on a Hong Kong movie set back then. Because they, first of all, they didn't give a rat's what you wanted to do, it was all what they wanted to do. Yeah. You'd do minimum of 30 takes, no matter what it was. You're on the set 18 hours a day, seven days a week. When the fight, in fact, the first fight I did with Summer Home took three and a half weeks to shoot. And I kid you not, I was on the set 18 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> and then when the fight stuff started, oh my God. And it was on the Shaw Brothers lot, which is famous for Bruce Lee movies and stuff. No air conditioning. It was, again, over 40 degrees, you know, Celsius in this place. Just a killer. And virtually full body contact with the techniques. Yeah. Someone hit me with sidekicks that just whoosh, sent me shooting backwards up against the wall. I got hit with bare-fisted uppercuts in one scene. Is I, that the one with the tennis rackets? Yes, those, yeah, yes. Yeah. And uh, Shoji Kurata, who was a Japanese, actor was in that and, and I mean I was like oh my god what have I got into here you know and with this uppercut so I've still got some old VHS outtakes of those scenes but people see the one shot movie he must have hit me 30 times and I found a little bit of cotton wool to put in my teeth because I didn't want to chip my teeth yeah I didn't know that's how it all worked I'm used to it was used to American movies where it's all the illusion of the camera but oh, what you saw happen was really happening notwithstanding wire work and stuff like that but it was full on and I literally remember three days into this fight with Sam I got to my room and I said you know what I said out aloud if I can get through this I can get through anything yeah. it was that hard timing was different everything but ironically you know I got on so well with Sam o because I was always in really good shape then not like now but you know and I, I, I was used to rough and tumble sparring and everything else so he really respected that I would do all my own stuff take the bumps get the lumps you know and mm. I just go on and wouldn't complain so Sam I really really liked me Jackie really liked me Jackie took me shopping around the, all the camera shops and everything which was a good thing because if if you weren't in that inner circle a Hong Kong stunt he's oh man if you were like a Brit on that set, then you would get a hard time. <laughs> you were stupid, you've got no timing, you know, this and that. But because I saw Jackie and Sam like me, I was like, I was okay. You were taken into the fold. <laughs> into the fold, but an incredible experience. I mean, the amount I learned from those gentlemen still today, obviously Jackie, you know, but with Samo, Samo Hong is still to me the most incredible action director I've ever worked with. That guy can put a fight together with anything at any time. Mm -hmm. And his choice of camera and everything and that particular style of shooting back then, just unbelievable. And, and the acrobatic ability of somebody like Samo. Mm -hmm. You know, the first, one of the first scenes he said, okay, um, up on this table, you swing this chair at my legs and I will somersault and do a flip and land here. And I was literally going, okay, where's the stunt double? You know, <laughs> I really didn't think. 
course he did it like as usual about 30 times and I went oh man and I just gained such incredible respect for Samo. Jackie of course you know the opportunity to work with an absolute maestro of martial arts movies who's still going strong today mm. as in Samo. So that's really how it started and because you know it was, Jap it was Kalata this Japanese actor that gave me the advice because I was it's always getting so frustrated with the timing of it and everything else. And he said, you know, Richard, i uh, give you some advice. And, and Kalak have done maybe 40 movies. He's very famous in Hong Kong. And he said, if you want to work here in these movies, he said, mm, don't say anything. He said, they don't care what you want to do. And he's being nice. It wasn't like putting him down. He said, he literally said they believe they're God's gift to martial arts. This is their set just and do it as many times and I took that advice so it just was many times mm. and so as a result I ended up doing three movies with Jackie and that was really not because I had any skills that were better than anybody else around it's just that they knew I knew how they worked I would shut up and just do it and particularly again for whatever reasons I had the timing that suited Jackie because Jackie's fights were people he fought with it was for him, it was all about timing. He hated the idea of, say, Americans coming out and wanting to prove how tough they were. And he said, it's not about fighting ability. Of course, that came into it. It was about whether they had the timing that suited the type of movement and choreography that he liked. And he said, you have timing, you know, and the fact that I was okay as an actor for what he wanted is what got me cast in a number of movies with Jackie as well as Another one was Samo, another one with an actor called Andy Lau. A guy called Wong Jing directed that. That's how I ended up getting the lead bad guy role in City Hunter with Jackie. Mm -hmm. Wong Jing, I'd worked with him. This is one of Cynthia's very early movies, Cynthia Rothrock, yep. who I met in Hong Kong. We did all of that. So, so it's really, you know, it's just about being around them, knowing that I would do what they asked, what I was asked to do, that, that got me some longevity. In fact, at one stage, there was the only actor to ever get asked to do more than one movie with Jackie. One of the other notables, I'm talking about in the Hong Kong movies, of course, mm. was Benny the Jet. Yeah. You know, he did a number because anyone who knows Benny, he's got that sort of ability that if, if you don't reuse somebody with that skill set, there's something wrong with you. So that, that's got my career going in Hong Kong. Yeah, cool. And how did you come up with the term painful? <laughs> painful? Well, that was Sam Hong. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because, because, well, kind of, you know, meaning that every, those Hong Kong movies, there, there was no Sing Sao. So you just, you know, they, everything was Cantonese or Mandarin. I just had to say lines that were along the approximate length of what the dubbing or the translation would be in Mandarin or Cantonese. Gotcha. So Samo at one stage, you know, he gets up and, and, and he's, he's going like this, you know, and or I, I think it was one of the first time I knocked him down and it just came out, you know, it's like painful, <laughs> you know, and he gets up and he goes fighting and then another time he's like, oh, like this and they said, how about now, you know, meaning painful now and he goes, oh, I can't feel anything because my buddy is all numb, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and off we went, so that ended up being a bit of a catchphrase for me, you know, that they use this, this term painful, so it was pretty funny because obviously the films there were all in weren't in English, you know. Yeah. Even City Hunter was no sync sound, you just everything, even Jackie's voice, nobody really heard ever heard Jackie's voice in those movies because somebody else would go in and dub them. Mm -hmm. And they would just add and even City Hunter was part of my contract I said, no, I don't I don't want anyone else to do my voice and mm -hmm. so I ended up doing that book, which was nice, but uh, <laughs> pretty funny times. That's fun. I, I got asked to write a book about my life on the road because I had intimate knowledge of everything that went on. I had adjoining rooms to the acts, you know, work with Mick Jagger, as you know, and all these people, David Bowie, but I always said never ever would I do a show in a kiss and tell book. I yeah. hate that because it was such a confidential position. James himself was, you know, he was a heroin addict when I met him. And again, I would never say that, but it wasn't genuine on James himself would admit that. Mm -hmm. I used to set up a punching bag for James, you know, before concerts, working with martial arts. Went to Martha's Vineyard when he was married to Carly Simon and teach him the Japanese bow. He loved it. The point being that it actually exercise became James's addiction. Yeah, I remember right. saying to James, like, you know, I said, James, again, 
like little, like John said, it's like nobody is smarter than James Taylor. James is the sort of guy that will know something about everything. If you said, how far is it, how rising? He said, well, if you're six foot tall, it'll be blah, blah, blah. And yet he was doing this. And I remember saying, well, you know, what is it with this other business? And I so remember him saying to me, Rich, he said, I guess I'll stop when I decide to. He knew it had to be his decision. And the point being that, you know, with, with being on the road James, and training so long, he actually admitted to me he stopped everything. It's been, God, how many, I don't know how long now. You know, it could be 30 years since he's touched anything, drink, alcohol, or whatever. He said exercise became his addiction. And I felt so good to be a little part of that. To the point that, um, you know, uh, James was in Australia some years ago with Carol King, who's, if everybody forgets how many unbelievable hits Carol King has written for the Everly Brothers, on and on it goes. Anyways, doing concerts, James found Judy and I through a tour manager and flew us to Sydney to hang out with him and his family, which also is very heartwarming that you establish that much of a friendship being a bodyguard, you know? And, you know, and we were chatting with Carol King backstage and James just suddenly said, Richard changed my life, you know. And I don't say Richard changed my life. What I'm really saying is almost through me, martial arts helped change, change his life, you yeah. know, through, through what I was doing and sharing with him. And that happened with Linda. I used to train Linda as hard as I'd train her from ground up with exercise and everything. We'd stop at the tour bus at places with James and the band and they'd be out doing karate exercises. <laughs> used to train Mick Jagger at four in the morning, you, you know, with throwing punches and everything. They loved it. That, that's pretty cool, you know. So it was, uh, it was nice. And Rolling Stone magazine once did an article on me touring with these bands. And again, I said, well, I won't do it unless you take, talk to the individual acts, which he did. He'd ring up different ones. And, you know, they did a whole story on, on these rock and rollers going out and coming off the road in better shape than when they went, which, in the 70s and 80s, it was unheard of. You know, it was madness. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, you know, when we talk about being a martial arts in the bodyguard work, you know, as you mentioned, I was on the road for 25 years. You know, and again, it started through Bob Jones. But, you know, I ended up doing, you know, after Australia, working with, as you mentioned, Flip with Max Stevie Nicks for years, David Bowie for many years. Um, uh, on it goes, Abba, you know, which is amazing. One of the, that was a bit rough because I had to train the girls often on beaches and bikinis and stuff. And then and that was, I found out a little grating on the soul. I bet. <laughs> As they say, tough gig. Yeah. You know? um, but, you know, it, getting back to the whole idea of martial arts, what, what's really, um, really great is when you look back at the influence that martial arts through yourself can have on people. Yeah. But anyway, I, I, again, I, I just put that through to that through line, as I said, that all I wanted to be was to be the best martial artist I could be. Everything good that's happened in my life has come as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Working in movies for me, I didn't have that absolute passion. It happened, but that was a way to get some more money in, to spend more time in the dojo.